We're continuing our study of judges. This week we're going to talk about Gideon. Uh, someone that... <coughs> one of those stories that we're all quite familiar with. Uh, or particularly the name Gideon and some of the events that went on in his life. But by his own admission, Gideon was an ordinary farmer in Israel from a, one of the least thought of tribes, Manasseh, and from one of the least thought of families. And, and he was the youngest in that family. So he didn't look upon himself as anything special. He, but, but that sounds like just the kind of person that God could use to, to do his work, to do his will. And that's what we're going to see today, how Gideon listened to God and followed God and helped deliver the Israelites. So we're going to pick up in Judges chapter 6. We're going to read verse 1 and then 11 through 16. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian for seven years. So the, the period of Judges that we've talked about started talking about last week. This was a very dark period in Israel's history. And it's, we're seeing again today what we're looking at. They, they find themselves in trouble. They find themselves turning away from the Lord. They find themselves doing things they shouldn't do. And then they get in trouble and then they cry out to God and then God delivers them through, provides them with a judge to lead them and delivers them. And for about a generation, everything goes well. And then... That judge dies off, and then it's a free-for-all again. They're scrambling to see who's going to lead them, forgetting that God is their king. We talked about that last week. And so the Midianites, of course, I guess technically you could say they're all kin folks over there, but we all are. I mean, Adam and Eve, and then from there we came. But the Midianites were kin folks. They were descendants of Abraham and one of his wives, Keturah, or not a wife, I guess. that She might have been one of his concubines. Abraham and Keturah. These were their descendants. And they had already fought with these folks once before. You remember they, they tried to stop the Israelites when they were coming into the <coughs> promised land. But here we have the Midianites and the Israelites had turned away from God. They were worshiping pagan gods, and the Midianites had come in to, to do their will upon them, and they would come in once a year during the harvest time, and they would raid, and they would steal everything, the food and everything they could find, so the Israelites were really oppressed. And then verse 11, it says, And there came an angel of the Lord, which sat under an oak, which was in Oprah, that pertained unto Joash the Abazite, and his son Gideon threshed wheat by the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. So here God sent an angel of the Lord. This is another one of those times that a lot of people think this is pre-incarnate Jesus. And he's there under an oak tree watching Gideon. And what's Gideon doing? It's harvest time. And and you're you're it says here that he was uh, he he was threshing wheat. And you know, normally that's done out in the open. They have a big open area because when you thresh them wheat, you have to separate the chaff. So you, you work it. I don't know exactly how you work it, but you throw it up in the air and the wind blows the chaff, the useless part away. And then you have the kernels left. Well, if you do that out in the open, the Midianites, they're out scouting around looking for who they can steal from. They would see you. So he's hiding what he's doing. He's hiding from his enemies. He's in the wine press, which is a sunken, below ground area, which doesn't work real good for threshing wheat because you don't get much of a breeze down in there below the ground, but that's where he's at. He's hiding. <coughs> hiding from those folks, doing the best he can to, to save the wheat that, he's ra that they've raised. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. So he tells Gideon, God's with you. You mighty man of valor. But here's a guy that, well, he says... And Gideon said unto him, O oh my Lord, if the Lord be with us. Well, he doesn't say it here, but this is when he's talking about what a, he's a nobody. He's a weak person. But the Lord sees in all of us things that we can't see. 
he sees that Gideon is a mighty man of valor. Not that he can be, but he will be, because that's the Lord's will. And he sees that in, he sees good in all of us. He sees what we can be if we would just listen to him, if we would just follow his will, if we will lean on him, as it says in the Bible, and not on our own understanding, but, but follow God. And that's what the angel of the Lord tells him, calls him mighty man of valor. And Gideon said unto him, O my Lord, if thou, Lord, be with us, why then is all this befallen us? And where be all his miracles which our fathers told of us, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord hath forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. So he immediately goes into the old poor pitiful me. So here's a man of here, here's here's an angel of the Lord telling him, uh, and he's he's asking if God is what's happened to God. That's what he's asking. What's happened to the God that our ancestors told us about that led us out of Egypt? and into this promised land. What's happened to the God that has done all of these things for the Israelites? What's happened to the God that led us here? What's happened to the God that's provided for us? Instead of looking at his reflection in a puddle of water and asking that question, because that's who's responsible. It's not God. God didn't turn away from the Israelites. The Israelites turned away from God. And that's what... Too, we can stop and think about in our life something befalls us there's a problem in our life something's going wrong and too often too many people will stop and wonder well, what's what what's happened to God why has he let this happen where's God in all of this and it's not where's God in all of this where are we in God's will it's it's not God God didn't turn away from the Israelites God doesn't turn away from us Thankfully, he is the most patient and understanding God that we can't comprehend how patient and how understanding he is of his children. And the Lord looked upon him and said, Go in this thy might, and thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have not I sent thee? The Lord, again, is seeing in Gideon what Gideon cannot see. He called him a mighty man of valor. And he tells him, he didn't chastise him about where's God and all this, what's happened to our God and all He could have stopped and explained to him, but he's going to show Gideon just what God will do. And Gideon will understand that it's not the Lord that's turned from him. He's going to understand by the end of this that it's Israel that's turned from God. And he's telling him here, He's telling him that you're going to save Israel from the Midianites. Have not I sent thee? Meaning, is it not God's will? Is it not my will? Has God not sent you to do this? Well, of course, if God sent you to do something and do a work, it's going to be accomplished. And he said unto him, O my Lord, where shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. So again, this is where he's talking about he's not able and that's exactly right. He's saying, how are you going to send me? Why are you going to send me? Because I'm nothing. That's exactly right. And the, when we're compared to, to God's capability, we're all just, we're like that chaff that's just blowing in the wind. There's really no use. If we're following our own desires and our own will, that's us blowing away with the wind. But if we're following God's will, we're like that kernel of wheat. That there's something useful about us. When we're following, that there's something there. And, and that's what he says here in our text. When the Lord calls, he also equips. When the Lord sends, he has already gone before us. If God calls us to a task that we think is beyond our abilities, remember, God does not call us to do what... Um, what we cannot. He's, he's not going to ask us something that... Anytime we say, I can't, we can't, that's not possible, all we're doing is selling God 
and his ability short. Are we going to tell God that he can't do something? Are we going to tell God that he's not capable? He's the creator of everything and all things and every, everything we can see and we cannot see. Anything that we can't imagine, we cannot imagine. God's the creator of all of it. And we're going to sit and look at God and say, I can't. When God has told us to do this, well, I can't. No. <laughs> God already knows that. But you're equipped because of God. If you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, if you know and you follow God's will and that's your desire, of course we can. And the Lord said unto him, Surely I will be with thee, and thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man. He says, I can't, and God says, Yeah, you will, because I'm there. I'm with you. And this and smite the Midianites as one man. This is kind of setting him up there. It's, it's not going to be just a single part, but he's fixing to show them how he's going to deliver the Midianites, and he's fixing to do it in a manner that everybody knows it was God and not them. Sometimes we have to be reminded of that. Judges 7 2. Well, before we go into Judges, first of all, right after this, Gideon, Gideon doubted. You know, and, and there's nothing unusual about that. There's nothing odd about it. Sometimes we get to reading about these people in the Bible, and like Gideon here, where he he wasn't so sure. So he asked the angel, "You got to show me a sign. You've got to. I need some affirmation." And he said, "I'll come back tomorrow with an offering, and and I need you to I need you to prove to me who you are and what can be done and what what I'm going to do." So the angel of the Lord said, "Fine." So Gideon goes back the next day. He he cooked up the meal, whatever, and he goes back. He prepared it, and he set it there on an altar. And the angel of the Lord lit it up right there. Just poof. Burn up the offering. To show him proof that he was who he said he was. To show him proof. To give him some affirmation. To comfort him. To help him feel like this really is what, you know, I am so, what I'm telling you. And so Gideon... You know, he got it. Okay, yeah. And then, a short while later, when God was telling him what the task is going to be, and so Gideon, again, is wavering. But, like I said, sometimes we look at these people, and so a second time before Gideon's really accomplished much, he did go into a town, and he took down some Asherah poles and things, and and that gave him confidence that first time and the people of the city were trying wanting to kill him and but he got delivered out of there and and so he he, he started out small a, a small thing and so now it's time for him to take on the Midianites and deliver Israel from all their bondage with, from those people and once again he's asking for a sign and like I said we look at people all throughout the Bible people are always asking for a sign show me proof you really are who you say you are and show me proof that you know I, I need confidence well we shouldn't look down upon these people asking for that because we do the same thing ourselves all the time we question God we we feel it on our heart we we know that we're convicted to do something to say something to you name it whatever it might be and we find ourselves thinking, okay, yeah, I know, I, but what, I, what would really let set me off on to doing this task is if I just saw a sign. Show me a sign, God. Show me what, and, you know, we're, we're in the same boat as what Gideon was here. We're doubting God and his word and his will. But you know what? I said, I said God's patient. He's understanding. Okay, I'll show you a sign. And so Gideon, this is where the, the fleece, the wool came in, where Gideon said, okay, I'm going to put the wool out there and, and, and after, after the night and the dew settles, um, the wool will be wet and the ground around it be dry. And so the next morning he brung a whole cup of water out of the wool and the ground around it was just dry and there was all kinds of water and wool. Okay, well, that's, that's easy enough. So tonight, do it the other way around. You know, still not good enough. So tonight, make everything else wet and the fleece dry. Okay, so sure enough, that's the way it turned out. Well, so he's he's building up his confidence. He's getting a little more mature. And the Lord said unto Gideon, The people are 
that are with thee are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands, lest Israel vaunt themselves against me, saying, Mine own hand hath saved me. What he's telling them here is Gideon has gone and gathered up an army to represent Israel, to fight for Israel. He's got 32,000 people. And God tells him that's too many. He's still got a lot less than the Midianites have. They're still going to be outnumbered with 32,000 people. But God said no, because if you go and you fight with 32,000 people, all you're going to do is think, look what I did. Look what we did. We Israelites can take care of ourselves. We, we kicked the Midianites and kicked them out of here. Well, God's telling him that no, you, that's too many people because that's what will happen. So you got 32,000 people, go and tell all of them that are scared to go home. If you're afraid of what's about to happen, just get on out of here. 22,000 people packed up their stuff and went home. He said, got 10,000 left. You still got too many. Too many folks. So take them all down to the creek and get them all a drink of water. Paraphrasing all this. So they go down and God tells Gideon to watch how each person drinks. And 9,700 of them got down on their hands and knees and bent down and stuck their mouth into the water. Kind of reminds me of our lab, our lab, Lane's lab, Nellie, one of our dogs. Nellie drinks water unlike anything I have ever seen in my life. She has a pan of water and she buries her whole muzzle in the water. I don't know how she does it and doesn't drown. I'm telling you, she blows bubbles while she's drinking water. <laughs> She's down with the water and nose down. She can't lap water like <clears throat> Willie the Bassett. He's sitting there just lapping up like you expect the dog to do. She can't do that. She buries her nose down in the water. Well, that's what these people were doing. They, 9,700 of them got down on their hands and knees and put their mouth down in the water and started drinking water. I'm, I talked about this a little bit a month or so back on Sunday in, in the welcome. 300 of them were... We're on task. 300 of them got down and got a cup of water and brought it up and drank it out of their hands. Lapped it up like a dog, he says. Well, you get it up and then you can use your, you know, you can lap up the water. But they had their heads up and on a swivel watching what was around them. They were, they were the guys. 300 of them. So he took 300 of them. He says here, in one sense we can be assured that God will thoroughly equip us for every good work. And in another sense, we can never think that it is by our own skill, intelligence, or strength that the work gets done. The Apostle Paul reminds us that God did not call the wise, the mighty, or the noble. Instead, he called the foolish, the weak, the base, and the despised, which is us. So he's got Gideon, and there's 300 folks there. Now, he did, Gideon didn't ask, but God, once again, gives him confidence. And he tells Gideon to go down to the camp. So Gideon and his aide go down to the camp of the Midianites. And you remember, they like to camp down in the plain. They like to camp down in the flat, down in the valley, so they can spread out and fight. They're not fighters in the hills. They like being down there with their equipment. And he's at a campfire, and one of them starts talking about, I had a dream. And I dreamed this loaf of barley rolled down the mountain and wiped out all the tents and all of us. All of it just took us all out. Kind of sounds odd, but barley being one of the least valuable grains and crops, that's pretty much what the Israelites were left with to eat, was the barley. A loaf of barley represented the Israelites. And the other guy sitting around the campfire recognized this, what was going on. He says, well, God's delivered us already. From the, I mean, he delivered the Israelites already. God's already going to, God's going to take us out. That's the Israelites taking us. And so here it is about the middle of the night, 16 through 22, and he divided the 300 men into three companies, and he put a trumpet in every man's hand with empty pitchers and lamps within the pitchers. So we're not talking about a brass trumpet like you go and see somebody play. We're talking about a trumpet, a ram's horn. 
if you've ever ran dogs in this area years ago, everybody in their pickup truck had a ram's horn or a cow's horn to blow when they're trying to round up their dogs. Or at least everybody in deer camp, I, I can remember Billy John having one, and Dad had one, my grandpa had one. It's kind of neat, you know, to, for them to let you blow the horn. Well, all of them have one of those. And, and it, it'll make quite a sound. It's quite loud. You can hear it from a long ways off. So everybody had that. And in their other hand, they had a torch. And they had a clay pot over the torch. Which means that that torch wasn't flaming up inside that clay pot. They had lit it and then they put that over it. And so it just smoldered. There's just some, just smoking and smoldering. There's some, there's some embers in there, but it's not doing anything. And he said unto them, Look on me, and do likewise, and behold, when I come to the outside of the camp, it shall be that, that as I do, shall, so shall ye do. So Gideon's telling them. He split them all up into three groups of a hundred. So they've surrounded the camp. That's what they're doing. And he tells them, When I come out, just watch me. And as we come up on the camp, do what I do. And when I blow with the trumpet, and all that are with me, then blow ye the trumpets also on every side of all the camp, and say the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. So you can imagine that in a battle, not every single soldier will have a horn, will have a trumpet, will have will be blowing a horn. They're, they blow these to give signals to the troops, to tell them what to do, to advance. To There's different sounds. I don't know what all of them were, but that's how they got signals to the different fight, people fighting within a battle because you can't just yell at somebody and, and say do this and of course they don't have radios to radio somebody for help so they would blow these horns well if 300 people have a horn I don't know how many people fighters they had per horn in a normal battle but if you got 300 horns blowing that's going to make somebody think there's a lot of folks here because that's a lot of noise there's a lot of horns they must have they got an army that's never been seen before. They got an army that's never been seen before. They got God with them. But they've got this mighty army. 300 horns blowing. Oh my gosh, how many people must be out here that they're directing with these horns? And so he tells them all to blow their horns and to, to say the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. To let them know they're coming at them. The sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And what do they have in their hands? They got a trumpet. They got a horn. And they got a torch. You notice they don't have any swords. They don't have any slings. They don't have anything to fight with except God. So Gideon and the hundred, hundred men that were with him came unto the outside of the camp in the beginning of the middle watch, about midnight. And they had but newly set the watch. They had switched over people. The, the, the folks watching, they had changed the guard. And they had but newly set the watch, and they blew the trumpets and break the pitchers that were in their hands. So you blow these trumpets, and you got this ram's horn in your hand. You blow these trumpets, and you smash that pot. Because it's just a pottery pot, and it'll break and crumble. So it makes an awful noise, I'm sure. And they're thinking, what in the world do they have? And then when you have a smoldering torch that hasn't, that's been deprived of oxygen, and you break that pot and you start waving it, all of a sudden it'll just burst into flames. It'll just blow out. And so now you got uh, 300 of these torches just blowing up this big flame. And the three companies blew the trumpets and break the pitchers and held the lamps in their left hands and the trumpets in their right hands to <coughs> blow withal. And they cried the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And they stood every man about in his place around the camp, and all the host ran and cried and fled. They didn't do anything. They blew their horn, they broke the pitchers, they waved their torch around and blew the horn some more, and stood and watched. Stood and watched what God can do. Just stand back and watch me, guys. That's what God told them. Stand back and watch what's going to happen. And the three hundred blew the trumpets, and the Lord set every man's sword against his fellow, even throughout all the host. And the host fled to Beth Shittah and Zareth, and to the border of Abel Meloah, and unto Tabith. So all these people in this army, this great big army, the, 
We don't know how big it was, but it was more than 32,000 people. They all get woke up and they come out of their tents in a slumber and they see all this and hear all this going around them and they're running around in such a daze that they take their own swords and start killing each other with it. Because in the pitch of dark of the night, you know, these folks all looked alike. These folks probably all dressed alike. You got a huge army. You don't know everybody in the army. They didn't know who was there in front of them. They just knew this great big army must have come down on them and was taking them on. They, killed, they started killing each other. That's how God delivered them. We're under their own sword. God will provide a sword. He provided a sword in their own swords. And they, they ran off. The ones that didn't get killed. And this is where the other 22,000 that went home because they were scared, they've now been emboldened because they see that God has delivered Israel. So that's what Gideon then goes and enlists them to chase down the remnants. And, and that's how we move on. They, they chase down the remnants of these people. And you might want to read through those more interesting things that went on through there. But, but what we see here, it says here that we too are called into a battle of insurmountable odds. The world has the finest scholars and thinkers of our times, they have all the money and all the resources. Evolution and so-called science seem to have won the day. The Genesis account of creation is relegated to the superstitious myths of ancient times. But still we are called to earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints that is under heavy attack. God calls each and every one of us to his will to do something that we're incapable of on a, of our own power. And we all know that. We know if we listen to God and what, what God tells us, what God's will is for our lives, we know that He'll that we're going to waver and we're going to think, I can't do that, we can't do that. No, we can't. But we can through God, just like Gideon. That's what this story is here for, is to give us encouragement and reinforcement. And yes, we can do that. And but what he's saying here that you know we're called into a battle of insurmountable odds. It was quite disturbing. I'm sure a lot of y'all have seen. I mean, this goes on each and every day. Not just necessarily in our neighborhood, but but all around the world, all around our country, and sometimes in our neighborhood. But there was a there was a university in Wisconsin. And there were some people protesting because of what was being shown and what was being said because they didn't like it, because it offended their progressive views, they think, their so-called progressive views. They think you ought to be able to do anything you want to do. They, they're just like the pagans that, that, that steered the Israelites the wrong way. And then the Israelites, of course, just fell in right with it. But there was someone there on that university giving a speech and, and showing a, a movie, a video, a documentary, and he was telling people that a woman is a woman and a man is a man. I mean, that's what he was about, that, that there is no, you can't change what you are. And so this is what, so the people that didn't believe in him, the people that were thinking that they should be able to say anything they want to say and do anything they want to do, they were protesting. And out there among those that were protesting, they were throwing quite a fit, was one young man that had a Bible and had a megaphone, and he was reading Scripture. You know, he was outnumbered, but God was with him. God gave him the strength and lifted him up. It's just my opinion and what I saw of it, to the point where they came and they were just all around him and, and making threats and this and that. They took the Bible from him. They took his Bible from him and started ripping the pages out of his Bible and throwing them on the ground. And one of them even ripped a page out and started eating it. And, of course, everybody's alarmed at that. And then I got to thinking, that's kind of uh, ironic because there's a place in the Bible, I, don't, I didn't look up the exact scripture, but it's talking about eating God's words and how it tasted like honey, how sweet it was. And I'm thinking... Maybe this is how God's 
God's there with this young man. This young man, as far as I know, when I saw he, he, these people didn't hurt him or anything. They just tried to scare him off and, and, and just beat him down in that manner. But I want to know today what that person thinks that ain't God, part of God's word. You know, did they find it sweet and fulfilling and yet not ready to admit it? I think they will. They will one day. They're going to realize what they said, what they did, and what, what God's done. But maybe that's the way God will help those people. We don't know. God's ways are not our ways. But if he puts a burden on our heart, and if, he, if we're convicted to step up and do this, we can be confident that he's with us pretty amazing to see what happened there and see what might happen from that. Gideon is a mixed bag of faith and doubt. At times, he was that mighty man of valor. At other times, he needed a sign and a fleece. Gideon was a man of faith, but he also struggled to believe. Sometimes he was a hero and sometimes a coward. Can we relate to Gideon? <laughs> we can. Can we also relate to the father who asked the Lord Jesus to heal his son? who was possessed with a deaf and dumb spirit. Jesus said to him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. The father responded by crying out with tears, Lord, I believe, help thou thine, mine unbelief. He says here, I feel that way a lot. I believe what the Lord says, the entire Bible, cover to cover, yet I struggle to believe, to put my faith in practice. I, have, I also have cried out to the Lord in tears, help thou mine unbelief. He's asking, have we ever been there? Of course, we've all been there. We read the Bible. We believe the Bible. We, under <clears throat> we understand and look at what these people have gone through and how God delivered them. And yet, when we find ourselves oppressed, sometimes we start looking in the wrong direction first. Sometimes we don't look to God first. Sometimes we look to what can we do? What, what can I do about this? What can, can, so, can somebody help me? I just need somebody to help me. We don't, we don't need somebody to help us. We just need to turn to God. <coughs> Gideon was also a man who saw his limitations. He saw himself as a nobody incapable of accomplishing anything on his own. But what he learned was that with God, the weak can be strong. The only way he could be a mighty man of valor was if God made him so. He learned that the battle is won not by human power, but by God's presence. Whether it be a battle with the Midianites or with destructive addiction, the victory is won by God alone. That is something that we must all learn. We have to learn that that the victory is God's and it will be won by Him, but we, we'll find ourselves like Gideon. We'll, we'll ask for affirmation and we'll get that and we'll, we'll, we'll be traveling well. We'll be feeling good about it and, and listening to God and then something will happen and we'll waver off and we'll get weak. We'll ask Him again. Get me out of this and, and I, I'm with you. you know, we, we just... If we're not careful, we'll find ourselves in the same boat the Israelites were with the time of the judges. Good times, and then they get distracted and fall away. Things get back on track, and things are going good, and then we get distracted again. I think it's all about us. The bottom line is God will win. God does win. Amen. We've all read the end of the Bible. We know how it ends. Jesus Christ is going to come back. We're going to, he's going to finish things up according to God's will, and we're going to have a new heaven and a new earth, and we're going to spend an eternity in their presence. God wins. In his battle and through his victory, will he use us? He wants to use us. He wants to use each and every one of us. We just need to answer the call and be confident that he'll deliver us. Be confident, like that little guy. He wasn't a little guy, but he was a young man that was quite outnumbered and, and outmuscled. And he stood there and read, the God's, read God's word to him. He witnessed to those people, regardless of their feelings towards him. 
But what he did will give somebody strength. Will give somebody. God used him, and he didn't use him for nothing. God wants to use us, and he doesn't use us for nothing. He's got a work for each and every one of us. We just need to be receptive of his will. And with that, I'd like for us to go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning. Thankful, Lord, to know that you win, that you have won, that Jesus Christ, death on the cross, and our accepting of this has delivered us into your hands, of which no one can pull us away. I just pray, Lord, that when the time comes for you to use us, when, when you have a work that you place on our heart, when we feel the conviction of this work for you, that we will take on with confidence, that we will accept and know that it's through your strength and not ours that it will be delivered. I pray, Lord, that you'll continue to bless the service today, bless each and every one of us as we step out into our community and share just what you teach us each and every day, that your son, Jesus Christ, died on the cross for each and every one of us, and all we simply have to do is accept his work on our behalf. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. In your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen.